I really wish I could be there in person with you all. I know this is a really exciting meeting and I really look forward to seeing the results of the discussions that are taking place both uh, within the key population led uh, community groups and, and, and also uh, with the broader stakeholders. So Michael asked me to briefly summarize some of the key themes that have emerged among communities that have been historically marginalized and disproportionately affected as we, as we know sort of broadly called key populations and kind of where we're at uh, in 2023. For those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Steph Burrell. Uh, I am on faculty in the uh, Department of Epidemiology at Johns Hopkins and have had the pleasure of when I looked at the uh, participant list working with many of you uh, over the years and uh, so thanks. So I'm going to try and very briefly uh, go through some of these sort of key themes. I know the focus is really on in-person presentations. Um, but just as an outline, uh, I'm just going to give sort of a very brief summary on what we know about HIV in 2023 uh, and, and then talk really about sort of like, I think these important and emerging themes within uh, the space around key populations in HIV, talk about the importance of criminalization, which I think many in this room know intimately really well, but just really talk about some of the data. And then I think highlight where there's opportunities in terms of increasing investments and, and then some key themes. I'm going to do all that very, very quickly. Thanks. So when we zoom out uh, and looking at sort of the most recent data presented by UNAIDS within HIV, we can see that there has been a slow and steady decline in, in the numbers of new infections since about the mid 90s. And I think that is in large part due to the efforts of many people in this room and, and, and around the world and really uh, implementing you know rights affirming evidence-based prevention and treatment interventions for people of, uh, at risk for living with hiv but i think one thing that we see is that like the decline in new infections hasn't been as rapid as many had imagined that it would particularly with the scale up of treatment and we ended up at, at over three times the numbers of infections that had been the goal in 2020 and it doesn't look like we're on track to achieving you know, the, the, the sort of goal in 2025. So I think that the place where we're at right now is that things are improving, but by no means improving at the pace that we would expect and that we would have, have hoped for. And I think in large part, you know, part of that suboptimal progress is because we still are not paying attention to two core principles within infectious diseases in the HIV response. So the first is really, really around heterogeneity, which is that uh, like the idea of a risk differential or that not all of us are at the same risk for HIV or in other infectious diseases is actually a fundamental principle of infectious disease transmission dynamics. And it says to us that addressing the HIV prevention and treatment needs of communities that have been identified as being disproportionately effective is central to an overall effective response. And the second is around equity. And that is to say that addressing the sort of underlying conditions that are causally increasing risks among communities, whether those be individual or structural conditions, is central. Um, because in the absence of doing that, we might actually amplify or concentrate risks among marginalized communities. And so what that is to say is that even if these are really well-meaning interventions that don't pay attention to these disparities, you can actually further concentrate epidemics and make them harder to control. And I think in large part, that has been the story of HIV. And so it just really reinforces the need for specific and well-specified efforts where we really like well-described efforts to address the HIV prevention and treatment needs of, again, marginalized and, and disproportionately effective communities is central to an equitable response. So one of the major uh, updates to our understanding in HIV is really this idea about the importance of HIV treatment and really that U equals U. And I think we have now multiple studies, but there were sort of these three paramount studies that highlighted that U absolutely equals U. And the first was partners phase one, which was focused on heterosexual couples across Europe with zero link transmissions after 36,000 condomless sex acts. Then there was opposites of track um, that took place in Thailand, Brazil, and Peru with uh, almost 350 gay couples 
Um, lots of years of follow-up and zero link transmissions after nearly 16,000 autonomous sex acts. Uh, and then finally, partners phase two, which was nearly 800 gay couples across Europe um, with you know, significant amounts of follow-up and uh, zero link transmissions after 77,000 condomless sex acts. So I think across these, there, it is, there was no documented cases of transmission when somebody had an undocumented viral load. And it means that UE absolutely equals U. But there's been sort of a disconnect uh, with other studies. So, you know, the er earlier studies that highlighted the sort of uh, trial studies, so Temprano in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, START, uh, which took place uh, across Europe mostly, and HPTN052 all sort of reinforced that uh, U, uh, you know, U equals U. And, and then I just uh, presented the observational data. But in these big, what were sort of thought of as these treatment as prevention or these cluster randomized trials looking at the overall population level benefits of treatment did not show those same benefits. And so actually when you isolated the treatment arms of these, you didn't really see um, you know, the, the sort of benefit of treatment that you would have expected looking at that observational data where you basically have no link transmissions when somebody's achieved an undocumented viral load or basically a suppressed viral load. And when we went back to the papers and, and really listened to the presentations, you know, the investigators in these trials would note significant challenges, like there was in and out migration into the clusters where they were scaling up treatment, people were diagnosed late, um, and then there was suboptimal retention. Um, but, you know, it's also really important to note that they would say that these interventions were patient-centered. And I will note, there was a lot of successes in these trials some of them included hypertension. They were able to lower hypertension. Some of them related um, to tuberculosis, and they were able to lower uh, tuberculosis risks. Some of them were related di to diabetes, and they were able to lower diabetes risk. So there was a tremendous amount of success. But it's also the case that they were focused on general population interventions. There was a very limited study of individual characteristics that might have explained why people migrated or why they were diagnosed late or why there was suboptimal retention. And I think that disconnect is really an opportunity um, for the discussion of the topics uh, that the meeting is about and, and this presentation. And so many of us would argue, and I think the folks in the room would argue, and I surely would, that a big part of this also was that we were not paying attention to, again, who uh, was not being effectively served by these interventions. And so if you look at the most recent UNAIDS donut, uh, where they look at the distribution of new infections, um, you know, they are now sort of approximating that more than half of all infections are related to key populations and their partners. Um, that is uh, dramatically less the case, uh, assumed to be less the case in countries across Sub-Saharan Africa, um, but still they are estimating that, you know, more than half of infections are related to key populations, the un I should say the unmet needs of key populations and their partners. Uh, but around the rest of the world, um, you know, that, that is more obviously the case. And so even here, we want to sort of dig down and, and try to understand this distribution a little bit better. So historically, when we've tried to sort of assess the benefits of, of addressing the needs of different communities, we have used a one-year time horizon in evaluating so the sort of modes of transmission studies or the incidence pattern model or even the sort of donuts sort of look at this as a one-year time horizon and in that context um, you have you know obviously far more sero different partnerships than you might for example related to a sex worker that is exposed to hiv through a, a male partner whether they be clients or non-paying and so that if you were to look at this as a one-year time horizon, it looks like there are far more infections related to their different partnerships. While I'll note, even there, I think it's fundamentally important to understand how somebody was exposed to HIV, because as we know, fishing, mining, trucking, these other sort of occupations are not inherently risky as it relates to HIV. And so I think it's still important to understand the actual underlying risk factors. But even there, 
you can sort of see that if you look at this, it would look like having a one year time horizon will always push you to this idea of addressing zero different partnerships without really understanding what the underlying determinants are as compared to focusing on communities where you do know the risk factor, like, um, you know, the unmet, again, prevention treatment needs uh, in the context of sex work. But we are now more than 40 years into HIV, and I think increasingly it's important that we actually take a longer term time horizon to sort of evaluating this. And so if you look at those zero different partnerships, in the context of stable partnerships, there's actually not a lot of risk of onward HIV transmission. There is the risk of vertical transmission if we don't do a good job of addressing the needs of, of pregnant women. Um, but um, there's not a lot of risk of onward transmission, which is fundamentally different than, let's say, that if a sex worker is exposed to HIV through uh, a client, you know, they are at risk of onward transmission to other male partners, whether they be uh, clients or non-paying partners. And if you look at that over a 5, 10, 20 year time horizon, you start understanding that in the context of being in larger sexual networks, there's a lot of risk of onward transmission unless we really intervene and we serve those needs to interrupt those chains of transmission. But it's only really with those sort of 10, 20 year time horizons that we really see how important it is to address those needs. And I think, um, you know, that is now central to the HIV response, that we take a longer term time horizon. And when we evaluate really the sort of the benefits and the cost effectiveness and all these other elements uh, of our interventions. So to operationalize this in the context of a mathematical model, um, when we look at a country uh, like East Swatini, formerly called Swaziland, with what we know to be a very sort of broadly generalized epidemic with really large numbers of folks uh, affected, if you sort of follow this down um, in the red line, this is using actual data from both uh, sort of the overall population of reproductive age adults, as well as the data specific to here cisgender sex workers. Um, and you follow along the sort of black line there, that is the maintaining the status quo. And you can see that there continues to be a slow and steady decline in numbers of new infections. But, and that is looking at the current uh, uh, breakdown of the cascade, which is 90, 90, 90, and then uh, achieving 80, 60, 80 among sex workers. But where we just get um, an, an increase, uh, you know, the treatment cascade just among sex workers and leave the sort of overall population data the same, we see these significant benefits that really uh, emerge over a longer time horizon. So when we think of the sort of leave no one behind strategy, we really see that, but we see it really manifesting over a longer time horizon. And so it sort of says that, you know, these generalized HIV epidemics can be sustained based on who you are leaving behind, based on whose needs you're not serving in these responses. When we look at uh, now what I think is a sort of a dated estimate, but the last time that a review really pulled together all the different sort of attributable fractions of HIV to same-sex practices, this was using these old modes of transmission studies. You could see that countries would estimate just that a couple percent of infections uh, were related to the unmet needs among gay men. Kenya had sort of the, long, the largest one, and I think that's really where they had the best data at the time of about 16% population attributable fraction, which is to say that the overall infections uh, related to the unmet treatment needs among gay men on an annualized basis. But we had an opportunity to empirically assess this and we used data uh, from Senegal where the government, community partners and others were really keen to evaluate that question empirically, because before they had said just a couple percent of infections were related to gay men. And in that setting, they'd say, listen, we don't have a we don't have enough resources to address every little population. Um, and so again, we really wanted to ask this because it was really relevant from a programmatic perspective, using actual data parametrized with Senegalese data from Senegal, and again, in partnership with community and government and others in, in the country.
And so to skip to the punchline here, what we can see in this model, and the, the reference is available for folks who want to read it, but in the dark blue, you can see these are the numbers of infections related to the unmet prevention treatment needs among gay men and other MSM in the country. And you can actually see a concentrating epidemic to the point that in 2015, the 10 year population triple fraction. So that sort of, if we were to intervene and avert those infections, we could actually be inverting about 60% of all infections in the country over a 10 year time horizon. And so a very, very different story than the earlier data. First of all, not effectively including gay men and other MSM, but also taking a much shorter time horizon to evaluating the benefits of those interventions. And we also use something called phylodynamic modeling there, where basically um, sequences uh, of HIV from, uh, from folks living with HIV were sequenced and compared to the data sort of broadly called the general population that are already in the Los Alamos National Lab where they document and include all sequences of HIV. And what you could actually see is that many of the infections that were sort of broadly called general population actually were very closely related to the sequences that uh, were found to be among gay men and other MSM in these sort of targeted uh, biobehavioral surveys. And so, you know, it's really just like this misclassification of risk. And then here again, there was somewhere about a 50% attributable fraction. So that's sort of the, the phylogenetic, this sort of sequence data matched the epidemiological model very well. And it really speaks to the importance of triangulating these different sources. And when you do, and you do that empirically, you can see that folks are really affected and that the benefits of interventions would be significant. But so what are these major barriers? And I thought it was important to at least present these data. Some of you may have seen them before, but I just want to speak to them. This was a summary of, of data that had been collected from more than 8,000 gay men and other MSM you know, in, in numerous countries where uh, these data have been allowed to be collected with a focus on looking at stigma uh, and other individual outcomes uh, from 2011 to 2018. And we were purposely trying to understand uh, the importance of, of laws uh, in driving HIV risks. And we use the OGA classification uh, where either uh, folks are not criminalized, so there's like no legal protection, but no specific criminalization, where there is criminalization of up to eight years imprisonment or severe criminalization, which is broadly considered 10 years to life in prison. And just to get to sort of the, the main point here is to show that you know, in settings where there is criminalization, gay men were more than two and a half times likely to be living with HIV. And in severe criminalization, that's more than five times. So that is after adjusting for a lot of the sort of individual determinants that we're focused on, we see that criminalization comes out as this incredibly powerful predictor of HIV risk. And even when we compare severe criminalization to just criminalization, it's, it's basically a two times uh, adjusted prevalence ratio. So even that sort of element of additional criminalization makes things you know, about two times worse uh, and just speaks to the importance of these laws. These laws obviously are not specific to just uh, gay men. Uh, here we had data from more than 7,000 sex workers, again, with the distribution across the continent collected over the last 10 years, focused on cisgender female sex workers who are greater than 18 and report more than 50% of their income from sex work. The classification here came from the NSWP where there's either partial legalization, uh, uh, including where there's legalized sex work under specific circumstances or the laws are not specified or there's criminalization. Uh, and you'll have to excuse that the, the box is, is a little off, but here again, you can see that comparing to partial legalization, where selling sex is not specified, sex workers had nearly a two and a half times increase 
odds of living with HIV and in criminalized settings, that's more than seven times. So that's after adjusting for a lot of these individual determinants again, we see that the laws come out as powerful predictors of HIV prevalence uh, among historically marginalized communities, both here, gay men and sex workers. And just to say that, um, you know, there are increasing data for transgender communities, but still um, we can see that, you know, even looking at a review that was uh, from 2020 to 2022, you see there's still really limited data from across uh, the continent of, of Africa. Um, most of the data are really emerging from the United States and some from Europe and really speaks to the importance of better understanding risk uh, differentials uh, between and, and within different transgender communities, including transgender women and men, non-binary communities to understand and better address those risks. Because obviously their needs are not being addressed uh, by programs that are focused on gay men and other men who have sex with men. I think one thing to highlight is that there's also a lot of opportunity that folks within PEPFAR have kind of come to understand that there are real risks uh, with not addressing the needs of key populations in the context uh, of, a, of an HIV response. And we've seen the budget increase to the point when there's about uh, $276 million being allocated in 2023 for key population partners and key population groups. And while I'll say, I still don't think that's anywhere near commensurate with where the risk is, as I've highlighted, it still is a dramatic difference uh, from where we were uh, even five or 10 years ago. So to bring us back to, to this sort of slide here, you know, folks are talking about zero new infections by 2030. They're talking again about these incredibly ambitious goals for uh, 2025 and, uh, and obviously we're past uh, 2020. The last few years have felt like a blur. Um, you know, I'll note, like, there is sort of this element of, like, what is the global HIV response going to do differently? What is it that they can be presented to understand that it's now fundamentally important to better address the needs of key populations or otherwise just refer to folks who are disproportionately affected by HIV all over the world? So to finish with some key themes, I mean, you know, there have been major advances in the context of HIV, and I'm sure many of them are being discussed at this meeting, U equals U, evolving and, and increasing the different ways that PrEP can be delivered. But it is also the case that it is the inequities in the coverage of these services that continues to sustain the pandemic. And another thing that I think is important, because many folks you talk to feel like HIV is over, it was solved, but it is also the case that defined by the number of people living with HIV, the HIV pandemic is growing and there are less resources available per person each day. And so when we think about that, you know, addressing those inequities is central to both an effective but also an efficient response because we need to be increasingly efficient unless in, you know, resources are really going to increase commensurate with the number of people living with HIV that deserve and need HIV treatment. Soon we will be at 40 million people living with HIV that necessitates an effective and efficient response. So just to finish, I'll say that, you know, equity and effectiveness are connected. You cannot have effectiveness in the absence of equity. And, and, and I don't think, you know, having equity in the absence of effectiveness is similarly uh, not helpful. And so I think we still have to kind of overcome these preconceived notions of who and why people are at risk for HIV, because we have no data to show that Things are different. We have our assumptions. We have what we've asked people, what we've not asked them over many years, but we don't actually have data to show that things are fundamentally different. And so I think, and it's also the case that like recognizing who is left behind, who is in that 10, 19, 27, even if we move to 95, 95, 95, who is left behind is going to be really powerful in sustaining epidemics. So again, I wish I was there in person. I've had the pleasure uh, and honor of working uh, with many folks over the years and, and look forward to seeing you all again soon. Uh, and wanted to thank you all for the opportunity uh, to contribute to this really important and key population-led uh, meeting. Thanks very much.